Having a good time? That's all I gotta know. Are you having a good time? First press conference, and usually I have to wake people up. You know, you've gone through a couple of these things, and uh, and I have the opportunity to do that. But uh, we're just testing today. That's what we're doing. So uh, put your pen down. Are you ready? Put your hands in front of you like this. Try it again. Come on. You can do this. Come on. Turn your hands over like this. And okay, cross them across like this. Then link them together like that. No, no, like this. Like this. There you go. There you go. Okay. Watch me carefully. On the count of three, all together. One, two, three. Boom. Do that. Oh, it's a slow group. Okay, the point is, look, I grew up in this business. I built my first amplifier when I was nine years old. I love this business. I love audio. I love music. I was a touring musician. I had a fantastic time growing up as a kid because my car was the one everybody wanted to ride in. It was a 66 Plymouth Valiant. It was an absolute piece of junk, but it had 10 grand worth of audio in it, so everybody wanted to be in my car. I love this business. It is something to, to imagine that we live in a business where we put smiles on people's faces. It began many, many years ago. I can't imagine what it must have been like pre-Xbox, right? Pre-PlayStation, pre-everything in the world at your fingertips. When the whole family got around together and listened to the radio, I get a little taste of that because I listen to Prairie Home Companion. And there's nothing like Garrison Keillor looking down off the side of the stage going, Yes, at the Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility Church, there was a bake sale this weekend. But anyway, the point is, is that, that we, people began with this kind of technology. And then all of a sudden, it began to grow, and it became all kinds of crazy things. Now, I was one of these guys, too. I was absolutely one of these guys right here. I was the guy trying to figure out how much putty to put on the head shell of my, of my turntable or my, my tone arm so that I could uh, make sure that my Koitsu moving coil cartridge, you know, would, yeah. I had one of those micro Seiki tables that had two bases, one with the motor structure and one with the turntable, and the two carbon fiber threads in between, and the 75 pound brass platter, and their claim to fame was, it'll go from zero to 33 or 45 in less than a second with a 200 pound person standing on the platter which is something you need in a turntable as far as I'm concerned. I think that makes a lot of sense. But the point is, I love that end of it too. Well, we've kind of fallen away from that just a little bit, haven't we? Just a tad, maybe? I don't know, because this showed up, which was fantastic for a couple of reasons. First of all, my four-year-old had now this in my music collection. That was something I would not have allowed before. If you were like me, you sat around with this hermetically sealed room in which your album sat perfectly vertical with the right amount of pressure, right? Because anybody knows that vinyl is not a solid. Vinyl is actually a liquid. It just happens to be a solid at room temperature. So those poor LPs were just degrading by the second. So temperature controlled, humidity controlled, keep them in the room. Children would get near them and it would be like, ah! And then the electric fence went up and I took care of that. I mean, it's just, you have to do that kind of stuff, right? But this showed up and all of a sudden, there was a whole new world, access. But unfortunately, what we ended up with was that beautiful analog signal that turned into this. And all of a sudden, we had a whole new learning curve. I was working in studios and watching engineers trying to figure out how to deal with the fact that basically their studio master tape was ending up in the person's living room. And by the way, it wasn't supposed to because by the time you punched it through an RIAA curve and then threw it onto vinyl with the various peaks and valleys that existed there, they knew how to master that. But now you took that same master and you recorded it to this and sent it home and ah, was it horrible. It's made a big difference. And then all of a sudden, this happened. We've got an idea. What we'll do is we'll take that information that we have digitally and we will now compress it fairly substantially and we'll put it in a library where any human being anywhere on the planet will have the ability to have access to every single piece of music that's ever been recorded in the history of mankind. You don't want to give people too many choices. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you've been there, right? Exactly. All of a sudden, you have to wade through so much garbage to find the music that's worth listening to. It's a whole different experience. But my point is, is that it changed the way people listen. And they gave us one of these. Boy, that's the ghost iPod. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. I have never seen it on the projector. That worked out well. Um, I actually have one of those white click pods in, in the backpack here. I remember because I was on the plane traveling the 100,000 miles a year I was putting in the air, and I pulled out my disc man and I set it next to me and I brought out my case with all my discs in it, you know, because I'm advanced, right? And there was a guy next to me who was about 82, and he goes, here, you gotta get one of these. <laughs> and I said, what's that? He said, oh yeah, look, I've got all my music on here. I got the Glenn Miller, I got the Count Basie, I got, you know. And I went, wow, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Right? As I loaded all my stuff out and tried to listen to one disc at a time, all of a sudden, 
music became accessible to just about everybody. And you saw people that were eight years old, and you saw people that were 80 years old carrying these around. And so then, those of us in our industry said, well, we'd like more. And they said, oh, no problem, we can give you more. We'll just give you more of the same thing. And we'll just load it up and give you more functionality, and we'll hand you more options. But really, they're giving us the same thing. And so we said, well, we want more quality. And they said, oh, you want quality? You didn't tell us you wanted more quality. That's not a problem. We'll just give you multiple different types of earphones to be able to listen to it on. <coughs> now, I've got, uh, I have a 28-year-old son and a 19-year-old uh, daughter and a 15-year-old son and a 10-year-old uh, daughter and a, uh, <coughs> a, a 12, actually a 12-year-old daughter, I forgot her, and a 4-year-old daughter. Okay, and so at this point in time, um, the great majority of them haven't ever spent time listening to True Fidelity. And when I ask someone to listen to music and they hand me one half of their headset, <laughs> Dad, you've got to check this out. Oh, that's wonderful, honey. The imaging's astounding, right? <laughs> A major frustration for me at that point in time because I wanted to be able to explain to them that fortunately my children grew up in a house with music, live instruments incredible sound systems. Why? Because like you, I have more gear in my house than most people will experience in a lifetime. I've got stuff stacked up in the garage, right? So when I play this for someone, I remember having a system that was so advanced that I would play music that people didn't like and they would sit and listen to it, yeah. wouldn't they? Because the experience was so incredible. Remember some of those recordings? Like the, they would take the drum and roll it across the stage and we sat there transfixed. Wow, that sounds just like a drum rolling across the stage. <laughs> Incredibly so, the fact is, is that that realistic experience gets lost. So what we wanted to do is make sure that people understood, and especially the youth today understood, that music should be a social experience. We have people diving further and further and further into an isolated existence. They sit in front of their computer, they Twitter people. It drives me absolutely crazy to have my daughter sitting on the front lawn next to her friend texting her. <laughs> Don't ask me why that happens. But the fact is, is that people are becoming more and more introverted. And the fact that they can put this buffer between them and the rest of society is frustrating for me. So we would like music to be more of a social experience because there is something about sitting next to someone and experiencing music that makes a huge difference. So the Vital 250 was designed specifically for that. This piece here is an integrated amplifier. It is uh, at 50 watts a channel. It's got an iPad or an iPod dock. It's sitting right here. Um, the idea being is that you can put a fine pair of loudspeakers with it and a subwoofer with it and truly reproduce the music. There's a couple of aux inputs and outs and whatnot. And also digital up conversion where you're using the Cirrus Logic chip to be able to take some of those badly compressed files and give them some new life. But the whole concept is, is to give people an opportunity to enjoy music as music should be enjoyed. It's also got other inputs in it to be able to uh, allow more functionality. The concept behind the Vital 250 is to be able to expand people's listening opportunities. That's really what we want to be able to do. And as Jeremy mentioned, we have the Flowbox. The Flowbox looks like this right here. The Flowbox is designed for that same experience, but the speakers are included. So you've got the ability to, to use it. Uh, it's got a, a beautiful finish on it. It has uh, mini USB for iPad, iPhone, or iPod. It's synced with iTunes. It's got, I mean, basically, this is designed to be a one box solution that has some real fidelity. That's what we're after. So that would be the idea behind it. Um, it will, like I said, it'll dock either the iPod or the, uh, either the iPod or the, uh, or the iPad. Um, it also, this little grill that is in front of it here, actually slides back and forth and allows it to be able to expose a series of controls underneath here. Um, and there's also a CD player inside. Why? Jeremy asked, why I'm buying CDs? Why in the world would I possibly buy CDs? Well, I don't know. It could be that whole fidelity thing. It's the same reason that I don't like any of my music compressed if I can possibly avoid it. Being able to play a CD in that is a wonderful opportunity, especially if you have an iPod dock on top of it, to be able to show the young people that there is a difference. So uh, especially if they've got that piece of music which they have downloaded from a friend who downloaded it from a friend who downloaded it from a friend who downloaded it from a friend who, a friend who uh, got it from some guy in Botswana. The point is, is we want to be able to take advantage of that. We also have a little mini version of this. It's not much wider than the actual iPad itself. It has the uh, same capabilities. It does not have a CD player on it, but other than that, it's basically uh, the same as the, the, the Flowbox in a smaller version. <coughs> 